Welcome back to the Gary Sutton Show on WSBA. Uh, Dr. Dan Geller is a uh, behavioral scientist and author of Money Anxiety. And, you know, for the first time, the total amount of annual consumer spending equals the total amount consumers keep in their bank accounts, their bank savings accounts, that is. Is that good or bad? Well, we asked Dr. Geller, who joins us this morning. He's been here before, and we welcome him back. Good morning, Dr. Geller. How are you? Good morning, Gary. It's always a pleasure to be on your great show. I love to have you on. And uh, and I'm, I'm, I read that little piece, and I said, is that a good thing that our savings equals our amount that, we are, uh, that we're spending right now? Well, it's, uh, it's good and bad. It's... The reality, what we are looking at, uh, as you mentioned, for the first time, the amount of consumer spending at $11.9 trillion for uh, all of 2014 equals the total amount that people, consumers, have in their bank accounts, which is also $11.9 trillion. And uh, this, as long as we have records, um, never happened. Uh, traditionally, historically, consumer spending was higher than the savings in the banks. Um, so, so that sounds yeah. like a that sounds like a good thing so far. I mean that that we're that we're getting back up. And we're worried more about kind of uh, balancing the budget, so to speak, right? Um, yes, but uh, keep in mind we are a consumption-based society. So uh, yes, savings is important, but too much of it like anything else in life, is not good. So um, I would say that to the normal situation is where consumption is slightly higher than the total uh, savings in the bank. Uh, what we are seeing now is really a delayed reaction from the recession. I mean, we can see, you know, I put a graph uh, on my blog on moneyanxiety.com that shows how the uh, amount of consumer spending and consumer savings um, emerged in the last few, uh, seven years since the recession. And um, this was a gradual process, meaning consumers saved more and did not increase their spending as much as they did after uh, previous recessions, and that's why uh, we have here the convergence point. Um, but this is a delayed reaction to the recession. People, the, the last, the Great Recession left some very deep scars, uh, financial scars with many people, and I think they are, they are much more cautious this time around as far as their spending and savings. Um, talk about... I'm really interested in what some of those scars are because I think we can feel them. I think there are a lot of people who are risk adverse right now. I mean, we're seeing the millennials, particularly as a, a generation, seeming like they're just now tiptoeing into the um, uh, housing market. Uh, but, you know, we see people staying at home a lot longer. We don't see people investing as much in the stock market because that they were spooked by what happened in 2007 so i mean we're seeing some habits there that that are hard to break when you when you were first faced in your adult life with a recession right that is absolutely correct gary so aside from the fact that this recession was deep and uh, prolonged compared to other recessions, there were also structural changes that came along with this recession. One of those structural changes is that the, although we have recovered many jobs that we lost due to the recession, the type of jobs, the mix of jobs, is not the same as we had before the recession. The jobs that are being gained now are mostly service-oriented uh, jobs, um, I would say lower paid jobs than the jobs that we lost uh, at the recession. And this is one of the reasons it's hard for the new generation to get into kind of the normal life path, financial life path of buying homes and all that. Another structural change is, as you know, because of the financial crisis, there were some changes in uh, lending uh, procedures, uh, regulations 
it's harder to get mortgages, uh, to qualify for mortgages, down payments are required, those are barriers to entry. So you're right, the, the new generation is not as fast um, entering the market, the financial market, as previous generations. I'm talking with Dr. Dan Geller, behavioral science uh, professor and also author of Money Anxiety. Dan, when, when you look at, you, you mentioned about getting loans right now, it's a lot tougher. We obviously saw a lot of people back in 2007 who were given loans for homes that they could not afford. And obviously there was a need to put something down there to make sure that didn't happen again. Now, that's a good thing. However, it seemed like we crossed over the balance line there when we made it so tough that people who really did qualify cannot qualify right now for housing loans because money got really tight. The banks said we're not going to get hit like this again. And, and the banks are kind of holding on to it. And as you mentioned, the regulations tightened it in. So do we kind of throw the baby out with the bathwater a little bit there by making it too tight that people who really did qualify would have a tougher time getting a loan than they might normally have done so? Yes, we did. You are absolutely right. And, and, you know, back to human nature and behavioral finance, what, what happened after uh, the recession is kind of human nature. The legislators uh, basically panicked, and they had to do something fast, um, and uh, they went overboard. Yes, um, in a way, Dodd-Frank pretty much tightened uh, credit and uh, availability and lending too much. And you're absolutely right. They are actually now hurting many people who should qualify for loans and mortgages but are finding hard time to do that. I mean, uh, the other day I heard, uh, read somewhere about uh, Bernanke who was trying to refinance his home, and he was told that he, his application was rejected because <laughs> he, doesn't, yeah, he doesn't have a regular paycheck. The former head of the Fed, Ben Bernanke, you think he's probably doing pretty well, right? He's doing very well, but you see now one of the, the qualifiers is you have to have a, a steady paycheck. Yep. He doesn't have that, even though he might be worth millions right now, I'm sure he is. You know, you on your website at moneyanxietyindex.com, you, and you explained this to me before, but I think for a lot of people who maybe didn't hear you the last time, I think it's really important to point this out because... Uh, this money anxiety index that you set up goes from low to high, the low being 38.7 to the high being 135.3. And I'm going to ask you what those mean in just a moment. But you actually predicted the Great Recession ahead of time with this thing. And, uh, again, if people want to go to that, it's moneyanxietyindex.com and follow along. Uh, how does this work? I mean, right now you have it at 65.9, so it's not quite halfway uh, and as you, the further right you go, the uh, deeper red it gets, and the further left you go, the lighter yellow it gets. So uh, tell me a little bit about the money index again, and for people who haven't heard about it out there. Sure. So the money anxiety index basically measures the level of consumer fear and anxiety based on different economic indicators. The The kind of the uniqueness of the money anxiety index is that it, it measures what people do, not what they say. In other words, what it looks at as is what people do with their money, not what they say in response to consumer confidence uh, surveys. Um, so uh, basically every month uh, we measure various economic indicators that have a strong and significant relations to consumer spending and to consumer savings. And the index shows us the level of financial anxiety based on what people do with their money. Um, so, like, right now, you, you're absolutely right, we are kind of in the, in the high 60s. Uh, that's okay. We, we went down from almost 100 uh, during and in, um, in the aftermath of the recession. 
so that's a good sign. We are trending down, and it looks like we will continue to go down, uh, or the level of financial anxiety will continue to decline moving forward unless something unexpected happens. Um, what are the things that you that you use, Dr. Geller, in putting together the, the money anxiety um, graph here? Um, you know, what kind of things figure into that for people? Um, as far as the economic indicators, you know, pretty much uh, many of the major economic indicators such as employment and uh, spending and uh, inflation, there are about 50 major economic indicators that we deal with, and it's basically a combination of, of many of them. Now, uh, when you look at where it should be, where would you like to see the money anxiety indicator? Where should it be sitting? Because uh, we talked again about, okay, savings are equaling what we're spending right now. Um, where would you like to see that arrow pointing on that graph? I think that if, if we reach um, anywhere between um, low 50s to mid 50s on the money anxiety index, this will be an indication that the economy is on um, um, a major recovery path, although we do have a recovery now, but it's a very, very slow and gradual recovery. Um, you know that um, when we look back at all the recessions that we had since the Great, uh, since the, um, great Depression, uh, we had different kinds, but never uh, the same as now. Typically, a recession has a V-shape or a U-shape. Right. V-shape meaning it goes down fast, comes up fast, the economy. U-shape means, well, there is a little delay down at the bottom, uh, but eventually it goes up fairly fast. Uh, this recession, the Great Recession, has almost like a, a, an L shape, almost like a, a hockey stick, uh, because the climbing back up is very slow, very gradual, and that's why we are still, we are seven years after the beginning of the recession, and we are still dealing with the aftermath of the recession, such as, you know... You know let, me, let me ask you this. How long has it taken us to get out of most other recessions, on the average, if, if you have a rough average? Um, typically, when we look back from the time the recession ended officially, uh, and recovery was maybe couple years the most. Okay. We were out of it. Now, why is this one so long? Is it because of the times we live in? Uh, you know, what, what has caused this to be, for a lot of people, feeling like it's seven years long? Now, I know there are many of our leaders who tell us that, hey, things are great, the stock market's up and all that, but a lot of people don't translate from the stock market to Main Street. They don't see that exactly, and because some people have been risk-averse not going back into the stock market as much, uh, they're, they're a little bit more hesitant, and they don't feel, you know, we hear about the wage gap, we hear about wages going down in our country. So why has this one been so much longer than the average one you're talking about? One of the reasons, Gary, is that it was deep. Um, people lost a lot of money uh, in the 401ks and, and other uh, savings and equity. You see, um, traditionally, Home equity was kind of the financial center of, of our life. Uh, people who owned home used to take home, um, um, home equity loans and finance other things. It was like the banking center of our financial life. And suddenly to lose um, an average, national average, about 40%, of, of the value of our home was very devastating. So that's number one, uh, the, the financial devastations to people. The other reason is the structural changes that came along. Um, not so much because of the recession, it just happens that during that time there was a shift in the um, in, in the type of jobs that this country now produces. We produce more service-oriented type of jobs than um, other type of jobs that we, we had before.
before the recession and we lost them. We're not making as many things as we are providing services, is what you're saying? That's correct. That's correct. And uh, for the most part, those jobs, the new jobs that are coming online now, pay less than the jobs that we lost during the recession. Right. And, and so uh, thus the wages are down. And I, I was interested last week, one of the things, I have so many thoughts going through my mind here, but one of the things I like about your money index is you base it on the financial behavior of regular folks, of real people, and what we truly spend in this country. And when you use that, it seems to me as uh, you know a predictor, then you are really making sure that your numbers are going to be pretty true because what you're doing, that's authentic. I use, I use the word authentic a lot, but that's authentic. In other words... What I buy and what I want and the supply and demand that, that I take part in every day and that you take part in as citizens and as people in this country really projects what's really happening. When And it seems to me that the more that the government takes from me and uses elsewhere based on choice, not on the natural exchange of goods and services, that seems to me to be inauthentic. I want to talk to you about that when we come back and get your thoughts on that, Dr. Geller. Dr. Dan Geller with us here this morning on the Gary Sutton Show's website, moneyanxietyindex.com. Check it out. I mean, it's really interesting stuff. And you can also read his book, Money Anxiety. You can check that out on Amazon.com or check it out at bookstores. Uh, he's going to be right back with us to talk about inauthentic versus authentic numbers and predicting what might be coming our way in the future. Would there be another recession out there anytime soon? We'll ask Dr. Geller that when we come back here on the Gary Sutton Show on News Radio 910 WSBA. Welcome back to the Gary Sutton Show. You know, I can't think of a better way to predict our financial behavior than looking at what we do with our money. The problem is... There is less and less of that because of taxes and regulations and things like, you know, Obamacare is an example where we're paying more money now. In some cases, we would have paid before. So every one of those dollars that goes out are dollars that we have now given up our choice on spending. Someone else is spending those. We're with Dr. Dan Geller this morning, who's a behavioral scientist and also author of Money Anxiety. I'm looking at his website, moneyanxietyindex.com, and I hope you look there with me. Dr. Geller, you know, when you look at all these people that give you all these predictions, especially politicians, politicians are notorious for telling you, hey, uh, we're doing really well, we're doing really poorly, based on some numbers they gather up. But the thing that they lose sight of, it seems to me, and I want you to tell me if I'm wrong on this, is the authentic behavior of people compared to what the government's doing with money. And what the government does with money is not the natural exchange of goods and services. It is the contrived use of goods and services on different things around the country where they choose to put it there, maybe based on friends, maybe based on their state, but it's not based on the normal supply and demand. Am I wrong on that? No, no, you're absolutely right, Gary. And the true measurement of the economy is to measure what people do out of free will with their money. Thank you. And you're absolutely right. And that's why the Money Anxiety Index is so reliable and so accurate, because people vote with their money economically and politically. So when they choose, when they make a decision to spend instead of save or vice versa, that's how they vote about the economy. How do you, when you look at your money anxiety index, how do you factor in the amount of money taken from people uh, by the government? And I, I call it legal plunder every now and then uh, after Frederick Bastiat. But um, how do you measure that in? Because t it seems to me that that would throw the numbers off if you measure that in. Or do you measure it in at all? Yes. Yes, one of the factors that goes into the uh, 
combination of economic indicator is taxation. Absolutely. Taxation is a major economic indicator and it is being factored in. Absolutely. Right. And, and obviously, the more taxation you have, I would imagine the higher the anxiety goes. Would that be a fair statement? Yes, it would. Yes. So, tell me the relationship here. You know I've talked about this before. We have about a minute to go. Tell me the best relationship, the best number that we should have out there in relationship to the money that we're saving and the money that we're spending here in our country. As a general rule of thumb, our spending should be slightly higher than the total amount that we save because, again, we are a consumption-based society. And uh, one of the reasons, by the way, that, that we here at the U.S. are doing better economically, let's say, than Europe is because we are consuming most of our products and services here, and therefore we can support our own economy. Seventy percent of our economy, or GDP, comes from our own consumption here uh, domestically. And therefore, if we consume at a certain level, we can support our own economy, and that, that's good news. We need to keep on doing that. Um, one reason we go into recessions is mostly because consumption goes down and therefore the economy goes into a recession. Uh, Dr. Geller, it's been great having you with us today. Where can people pick up money anxiety? Basically anywhere, but especially Amazon.com, Bounce and Noble, um, iTunes Store, uh, Google Play, everywhere um, where they sell books. Well, you're always a fabulous guest. Thank you so much for breaking that down for us this morning. I look forward to our next time very, very soon. Thank you, Gary. Likewise. Thank you, Dr. Geller. Dr. Dan Geller with us here on the Gary Sutton Show. The name of the book, Money Anxiety, or you can go to moneyanxietyindex.com.